Okay, well, let me let me start by uh, just introducing the context and then I'll introduce our speaker. So welcome to all of you. We have people here from uh, McGill and Environs, but also people all over the world. So uh, that's terrific. Uh, this is our Thursday afternoon uh, seminar uh, or speaker series of the uh, Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry at McGill. Within this uh, time slot in this framework, we actually have several different series. Um, we have one that we call Culture, Mind and Brain that is about sort of interdisciplinary work in that intersection. We have uh, another series called Global Mental Health and another series called Culture and Clinic uh, and then uh, other things that are more related just to cultural psychiatry in general. Uh, the presentation today cuts across several of these categories, most of them in one way or another. Uh, and so um, it'll be of interest, I think, to a wide range of people. We do record these talks and then with the approval of, uh, of the speaker, we make them available. Um, and so uh, just to let you know, you know, that um, that's, uh, that's what will happen with this at the end. If uh, you do end up uh, make, asking a question or making a comment or whatever, we'll try to check it with you before it goes up. Sometimes we just, we just edit out all the discussion part. It just depends how it flows and how essential is it is for the core uh, presentation to have that around. Uh, and um, we, because we will have, I think, quite a few people, uh, we'll see how, what kind of process we can have after the talk for discussion in terms of people speaking up directly uh, or writing comments. And feel free as it goes along to write comments or questions in the chat so that we can also help, I can help chair that or Anna Gomez who's co-chairing can help uh, with that in terms of uh, relaying the questions and giving uh, our speaker a chance to, to respond. So with that uh, sort of general preamble. It's my great pleasure to, uh, to welcome Professor Mitchell Weiss, uh, who's joining us uh, today from uh, Switzerland. Um, uh, uh, Mitchell is a psychiatrist and uh, anthropologist uh, with extensive training and uh, research experience over uh, decades. Uh, working in the whole broad field of, of uh, cultural psychiatry, but also um, clinically applied medical anthropology and uh, cultural epidemiology. Uh, and uh, he's made many contributions, but many of you will be familiar with the work that he did early on in taking the explanatory model framework that Arthur Kleiman had proposed as a kind of a tool for medical education and, uh, and as an uh, informal, I guess, tool in, in medical anthropology and turning it into a more structured kind of tool that could be used more systematically uh, to look at explanatory models and uh, conceptions and expressions of distress cross-culturally. So that work has been really seminal and provided a, a methodological framework for many people to begin and, and set of tools for many people to really begin work in this area. And over the years, Years. Mitchell's done a lot of important work, often with colleagues in India, but also in Africa, uh, on infectious disease and cultural meanings and implications of people's uh, understandings of infectious disease, uh, as well as very basic questions in, uh, in uh, medicine and uh, cultural psychiatry. Uh, the talk today is related to ongoing work, as he'll explain, related to um, bringing um, a social medicine uh, framework together with some of the concerns and interests of cultural psychiatry. Uh, and um, some of us have been able to, um, you know, begin these discussions with Mitchell around efforts to begin to think about how we might reshape the outline for cultural formulation in DSM-5 and so on. So that's only one facet, I think, of the work that, um, you know, that he's doing and that he'll be presenting, but it's an important one in terms of the influence of that framework in, in in psychiatric practice. Uh, so I've had the pleasure of sort of being a fellow traveler with Mitchell for a very long time. We worked together on uh, one of the sub sub work groups uh, uh, within the larger culture and diagnosis group for uh, DSM uh, uh, four. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm just so delighted and th thanks partly I should acknowledge to Ana Gomez Carrillo uh, who's working together with uh, uh, Mitchell and myself and other people at the group for the advancement of uh, psychiatry on this whole question of uh, incorporating or, or transforming the outline for cultural formulation uh, through the perspectives of social medicine. So with that bit of, uh, I know, I guess, fuzzy background here, uh, I'm very happy to turn the session over uh, to Mitchell and thank you again for uh, being available to join us. Okay. Well, thank you, Lawrence, for the introduction and uh, 
for inviting me and thank you, Anna, also. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to join the seminar today and present ideas about the relationship between cultural and structural issues in clinical practice. Questions about the relationship between cultural psychiatry and social medicine have been germinating in my thinking for a very long time. And experience over the past year and renewed focus on structural uh, racism and Black Lives Matter movement, the issues of caste and coloniality have highlighted the need to examine the relationship between the organization of a cultural formulation and the organization of society more closely. The interpretive focus of the cultural case formulation, uh, which was included in the outline for uh, cultural formulation, the OCF and DSM-4, now needs some updating. Uh, in this talk today, I'd like to show why and how it needs to acknowledge more explicitly and clearly implications uh, of the impact of structural features of society. Historically, alternative ideas and orientations have competed for dominance in psychiatry. Mind and body, psychology and biology, behaviorism and depth psychology, such orientations have important implications for practice. And um, questions about whether these ideas are mutually exclusive or complementary are highly significant to our field. As an advocate for the benefits of integration, I'll explain why I think that harmonizing the interests of cultural psychiatry and social medicine will help to meet some of the current challenges. My teacher, Leon Eisenberg, was chair of the Department of Social Medicine at Harvard when I was training. In an article that I'll refer to at several points in this presentation, Eisenberg referred to the advice of his teacher, Leo Kanner. Kanner advised that we should examine the history of our field with an approach similar to the way that we examine patients. Eisenberg wrote, I remind you of Kanner's sage advice that just as a careful anamnesis is indispensable for an adequate understanding of our patients, an anamnesis of our specialty is an indispensable guide to understanding its present status. Richard Hunter and his mother, Ida McAlpin, were both English psychiatrists and historians. In the uh, uh, source book that they wrote of more than 1,100 pages, they acknowledged the complexity in the preface of the ongoing challenge and um, ways, uh, what the challenges were for advancing and refining the field of psychiatry, owing mainly to its interdisciplinary nature and uh, its complex underpinnings. What makes psychiatry so complex is that it belongs to both the natural sciences and the humanities. To define the uh, proportion and sphere of each remains for the future to determine. And of course, the natural sciences themselves uh, and the humanities are each complex in their own right. Philosophical questions about the fundamental nature of reality as essentially mind and or body have influenced thinking and practice in psychiatry. And is one real and the other an artifact or are they both real and complementary? And if so, how are they related? Various answers to that question may be suggested from our anamnesis of the field, some regarding their approach as exclusive truth and others advocating integrative frameworks. The dualism of Descartes acknowledged the reality of both body and soul. His account not only affirmed the validity of both, but it also explained how and where we might locate that, that connection between them. The soul, the mind, was the location of thinking and the source of thoughts. And he located the nexus of mind and body in the pineal gland as illustrated um, 
as illustrated in this figure. Descartes came to that conclusion because he identified the pineal gland as the only unduplicated structure in the anatomy of the brain. Historically, psychiatry with its mission to care for people with mental illness had a fraught relationship with neurology, a proud medical science. Asylum superintendents were looked down on by academic neurologists. The work of neurologists and the reality of brain and nervous system were medical, but the caretaking and the work of asylum superintendents were not. The infamously condescending remarks of neurologist Ware Mitchell at a meeting of asylum superintendents in 1894 indicated that disdain. You live alone, he said, uncriticized, unquestioned, out of the healthy conflicts and honest rivalries, which keep us neurologists up to the mark and the fullest possible competence. The transition into a medical science with the term psychiatry replacing alienism and the term psychiatrist replacing alienist for practitioners had begun to change, but only gradually and inconsistently in the 18th and 19th centuries. Mental hospitals began to replace lunatic asylums and the term patients replaced inmates or lunatics. According to Parry Jones, wards for chronic lunatics were established at Guy's Hospital in London in 1724. In Boston, the McLean Hospital was opened in 1818. And in India, it was only in the 1920s that the term mental hospital replaced lunatic asylum. Beginning in the 1950s, Developments in psychopharmacology further reinforced interests and the priority of biological psychiatry. It should be noted, however, that these medicines were not derived from any scientific analytic process. They were, in fact, chance discoveries. Racerpine, chlorpromazine, ipronizid, imipramine, lithium, etc. These came about in the mid 20th century. Uh, although some had been known longer, uh, far longer for racerpine, a drug that was known in Ayurvedic texts and lithium discovered in the 19th century, but approved um, by the FDA in 1970. The ascendance of psychopharmacology helped to align psychiatric research and practice with other medical disciplines. Interest in drug trials motivated development of the DSM-3 as a criteria-based nosology that better served the needs of drug trials. Psychiatry in the 20th century, however, wasn't all biology and body. Psychoanalysis and depth psychology also played an important role. That was especially true in American psychiatry. By the 1950s in the United States, most academic department chairs and leaders in psychiatry also had a training credential in psychoanalysis. Although American psychiatry might not have been the sleek racehorse suggested by Eisenberg's equine metaphor, especially in the absence of social science considerations beyond psychology, his reference to the lineage is apt. His account acknowledges the duality and identifies a paradox that reminds us of Ware Mitchell's criticism of earlier alienists. Eisenberg explains, if asylum psychiatry be taken as its sire, American psychiatry has psychoanalysis for its dam. Like the alienist, the psychoanalyst thrived outside the academy, unencumbered by scientific methodology an anomaly among medical specialties in that influences outside academe had so powerful a role in determining its intellectual content and career lines. In his work, which I've been citing from a published lecture titled Mindlessness and Brainlessness in Psychiatry, Eisenberg argued for an integrated framework rather than a psychiatry that was based exclusively on either biology or psychology. I reject the, neurolog uh, the neurologizing tautology, he wrote, that only those facts are scientific 
which can be reduced to nerve cells and the claim for psychoanalysis as the exclusive way to salvation. To explain that, he refers to a metaphor based on the de Broglie hypothesis in subatomic physics, which personally I find appealing because of my own background in undergraduate, uh, as an undergraduate physics major. I'm not sure you'll find it quite as appealing, but um, just to explain, uh, the idea was that though light might be understood as either waves or particles, that is photons, wave theory is appropriate for explaining diffraction, some phenomena, but particle theory better explains the photoelectric effect in the field of physics, just as mind and body may better explain related features of psychopathology. Eisenberg's eclectic views about the role of biological and psychological frameworks followed in a line similar, uh, it followed a line of similar thinking through a lineage associated with Adolf Meyer. Meyer had migrated to America from Austria and he was the first psychiatrist in chief at Johns Hopkins from 1910 until 1941. There, he oversaw the establishment and development of the Phipps Psychiatric Clinic. He had also hired Eisenberg's mentor, Leo Kanner, who I mentioned earlier, who was the first clinician in the US to be identified as a child psychiatrist. Meyer advocated the term psychobiology, encompassing all the biological, social, and psychological factors and symptoms pertaining to a patient. Note that the term psychobiology has now acquired a different meaning. Um, it now more typically refers to a term for neuroscience underlying biological psychiatry. That was different from the way Meyer was using it. Though Meyer found many of Freud's ideas and therape uh, therapeutic methods useful and insightful, he rejected psychoanalysis as a wholesale ideological explanation of mental disorders. In his presidential address to the 84th annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, he proclaimed, those who imagine that all psychiatry and psychopathology and therapy stand or fall with one's feelings about psychoanalysis are equally misguided. George Engel, who trained in medicine at Hopkins, was also influenced by Adolf Meyer. He criticized the dominance of biomedicine and the influence of the biomedical model. As an alternative, he proposed the biopsychosocial model. His article published in Science in 1977 was and remains highly influential. He concluded the dominant model of disease today is biomedical and it leaves no room within its framework for the social, psychological and behavioral dimensions of illness. Note also that Engel recommended this biopsychosocial or BPS model as a blueprint to guide research, teaching and clinical practice. Engel was concerned that biomedical thinking had become a cultural imperative. He identified the problems arising from its impact on medical theory, research, and on the values and priorities of clinicians in their practice of medicine. He argued that his integrated approach worked better for understanding clinical problems, and it provided a better guide for effective clinical care. Note, however, that his idea of social, a term he used 28 times in the science article, was mainly referring to interpersonal aspects of social. And in his writing, he often linked social and psychological as psychosocial, a term he mentioned 15 times in that article. Engel's account of social was for the most part inattentive to questions concerning structural features of society. The BPS model did provide an alternative to the biomedical model as Engel intended. The scope of psychological and social considerations, however, does not meet the needs suggested 
by interests of clinical ethnography and societal structural analysis. Psychological referred to professional psychological considerations. Social referred to the influence of family and others, and it also referred to social behavior. Consequently, the biopsychosocial model does not adequately address the interests of cultural psychiatry and social medicine. For cultural psychiatry, concepts and methods developed in the field of clinically applied medical anthropology are directly relevant. They have provided the kind of blueprint for research and practice that Engel valued with regard to aspirations of the biopsychosocial model. Medical anthropology has motivated and guided much of the development of the field of modern cultural psychiatry. Principal concepts and practices uh, include reference to the distinction between disease and illness, cultural concepts of distress or explanatory models, idioms of distress, cultural syndromes, etc clinical ethnography, and the cultural formulation, which we'll have more to say about um, in a few minutes. At this point, we should also acknowledge the potential clash regarding values and priorities across disciplines. It's not just the relationship between biomedicine and social science that is problematic, but also issues in the relationship and priorities of various social science disciplines and orientations within them that needed and still need to be worked out. Health social science critiques from a sociological vantage point focused at an early stage on the interpretive focus of medical anthropology. They argued that the emphasis on cultural meaning and clinical hermeneutics gave too little attention to societal structure. Ronnie Frankenberg was a professor of both social anthropology and sociology, uniquely straddling the two fields in the, in the UK. As a student of medicine attracted to anthropology, he had abandoned medical studies to become an anthropologist. With a commitment to communities where he worked, he went to the Caribbean for his doctoral research. He had to abort work there, however, when he was deported from Barbados because officials there found his quote, communist sympathies unacceptable. As an alternative, he did his field work in Wales. His work focused on the role of power, political economy and gender in seemingly idyllic villages, communities, uh, communities that turned out to uh, be far more complicated than they were idyllic. Frankenberg was a discussion at an NSF meeting where the explanatory model framework was presented at an early stage in the course of its development. In his comments published in 1976, he noted that it's necessary to situate the analysis of a cultural system within a system of political economy, not just to give lip service to the presence of both social and cultural systems. That critique of the explanatory model framework has also been applied to uh, Engels' biopsychosocial model and to the work of Adolf Meyer before him, suggesting that they obscure other needed critical explorations, medical authority, professional power, subsystems of power, and the role of the pharmaceutical industry. Such issues were the focus of a movement developing in Europe for a public medicine in the mid 19th century. The principles and practice of social medicine rooted in the work of Rudolf Virchow were strongly influenced by experience of epidemics and political upheaval in Europe in 1848. Though he supported the quest for democratic reform Virchow was distressed by the chaos resulting from the wave of revolutionary uprisings, which included barricades in the streets of Berlin. He referred to the situation as, quote, a psychic epidemic. 
Virkov was famously asked by the Prussian Minister of Culture to investigate a typhus epidemic in 1848 in Upper Silesia, then located in East Prussia, now in Poland. The link between social and political policy options affecting the well being and health of persons and populations was an enduring emphasis in his commitment to social medicine. Key features of that approach to social medicine are indicated on this slide. The famous slogan um, conceptualizes that idea that, quote, medicine is a social science and politics nothing but medicine on a grand scale. Um, Birkhoff was also a politician. Uh, he organized the political party, the German Progress Party early in his career. And later he was elected to several political offices, including the Reichstag. Advocacy, advocacy for social and health financing instead of the military brought him into conflict with Chancellor Bismarck, uh, who at one point challenged him to a duel and it required the intersection, uh, intercession of uh, some colleagues in order to probably have saved his life. Um, the principles of social medicine rely heavily on integrating social and medical measures interventions, as well as ways of assessing public health problems. They advocate for employment, income, housing, nutrition, and Virchow wrote that freedom without education leads to anarchy. Education without freedom leads to revolution. Education was a major tenet. Three elements of the context and his experience in 1848 are especially important. They refer to politics, experience in epidemics, and establishment of a journal called Medical Reform. Um, many of the students of Virchow have, have suggested that this um, experience in, in, in politics and um, um, with epidemics were responsible for his development of social medicine. But as uh, his translator LJ Rather points out uh, in remarks about Virchow, he was also led by his conception of the true nature of the discipline of medicine. Those events in 1848 included the French Revolution and the establishment of the Second Republic followed by multiple uprisings throughout Germany, street fighting in Berlin, and the spring of the nations, a point when Marx published the Communist Manifesto. Virchow investigated several epidemic outbreaks, the typhus outbreak in Upper Silesia, um, which in his report published in 1849, he attributed primarily to poor social conditions, neglect, disparities, linguistic and cultural disenfranchisement of the affected population. With a psychiatrist friend, Rudolf Neubuscher, uh, Virchow at a point when he was only 27 years old, established a journal that proved to be highly influential, although it was short lived. Only about 14 numbers were published in 1848 and 1849. Social medicine, like medical anthropology, provides an integrative alternative to, limited, uh, to the limitations of a biomedical model. Although I mentioned earlier the potential for interdisciplinary clashes between anthropology and sociology and schools within them, the two disciplines are also notable for their considerably overlapping agendas. That point was underscored with the establishment of the Rudolf Virchow Award by, special, by a special interest group of the Society for Medical Anthropology. The award, this Virchow Award, uh, honors work in the spirit of Rudolf Virchow that emphasizes social and political economic aspects of health, disease, and healing at both micro and macro levels. It was first awarded in 1987, and I think you will not be surprised when I tell you that the first recipient 
was Ronnie Frankenberg. Other closely related concepts associated with social medicine are indicated on this slide. The question of social determinants, which was the topic of uh, major studies supported by WHO and associated with the work of uh, Michael Marmot. Structuralism as a um, wide ranging theory in many disciplines linking structure with function. Questions of structural violence and structural competency, which I want to focus on and elaborate further at this point. In 2009, in his book on the protest psychosis, how schizophrenia became a black disease, Jonathan Metzl introduced the term structural competency for the first time. He suggested that the idea might be helpful to provide some degree of the expertise required to understand the biological in the context of the structural or the historical or the political. Earlier models such as cultural competency focused mainly on identifying clinical bias that was the argument, and um, improving communication. Uh, the development of structural competency aimed to bring attention to other structural concepts. Similar to earlier critiques of explanatory models and the biopsychosocial framework and Adolf Meyer, proponents of structural competency have highlighted inadequate attention to effects of structural features of society in their criticism of the cultural competence framework. Recent work on structural competency highlights four benchmark skills as a guide for the organization of training programs to impart the needed expertise. Uh, these skills include recognizing, training students to recognize the structures that shape clinical interactions, not just patients' beliefs and behaviors, but the structures in the society's communities that they live in. Rearticulating cultural formulations in structural terms, observing and enacting structural interventions, <coughs> developing structural humility, these, a point which, was, which, which is elaborated in the training. A recent book uh, presents chapters uh, that provide an account of structural competence training programs in various sites, some dealing with uh, the work carried out in classrooms and clinics, others dealing with structural competency in non-health sectors, structural competency in community engagement, and structural competency uh, in policy advocacy. Related activities indicate how social medicine is being applied in clinical practice. A series of case studies in social medicine published in the New England Journal of Medicine provides practical examples demonstrating the relevance and usefulness of particular social theories. They, they are, each, of those, uh, each of the case studies focuses on a particular, ex, uh, a particular social theory and shows how it is illustrated by that case. At this point, I'd like to shift attention from social medicine and structural competency comparable interests in cultural psychiatry. The outline for cultural formulation was developed as a product of a national task force on culture and psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, the group met in April 1991 with the aim of facilitating consideration of culture in the DSM and in clinical practice. Lawrence referred to those meetings uh, in the introduction. The OCF was included in Appendix I of the DSM-4 published in 1994. It provided a framework for assessment and cultural case formulation. Four, com uh, uh, four complementary 
uh, excuse me, it, it provided a, a framework for assessment and cultural formulation. And in that way, it complemented diagnostic assessment. Mandated by the APA, it was um, the group felt some responsibility uh, to demonstrate how the cultural formulation improved the process of diagnosis. The four domains included cultural identity, cultural explanations of the individual's illness, a focus on the impact of the psychosocial environment in the, affecting the patient's problem and functioning, and the relationship between individual, the individual patient, and the clinician. The fifth domain was essentially an overall assessment, a summary and consideration of implications uh, for care. In the DSM-5 published in 2013, a chapter on cultural formulation provided a minor update to the OCF. It, shifting the text on cultural formulation from an appendix where it was located in the DSM-4 to the main body of the manual in section three of the DSM-5 enhanced the visibility of cultural interests. Development and inclusion of the CFI highlighted the significance of culture for mainstream psychiatry. It also provided a tool that clinicians and residents could work with. Experience suggested the value of the CFI was based on two distinct but complementary interests. One, it helped the interview process, enhancing a therapeutic alliance. And two, the value of the relevant clinical data that was elicited by the interview. Since it was first published in DSM-4, the OCF has been used for residency training in cultural psychiatry. It's also been used as a framework for clinical communication and publications. Roberta Luis Fernandez had a whole series of publications, case formulations um, uh, based on the OCF in the journal Culture, Medicine and Psychiatry. That was well before development of the CFI as a practical interview guide. Development of the CFI aimed to make the OCF more operational and more useful, but it wasn't completely clear how to relate one to the other because the structure of the CFI for assessment was different from the structure of the OCF for case formulation. The site in Pune, led by Dr. Vasudev Parelikar, was among the field sites testing the CFI to ready it for inclusion in the DSM-5. This group critically examined how interview data from use of the CFI fit into the framework of OCF case formulations. The team considered implications based on their data and recommended adjustments and revision based on considerations of both cultural competence and structural competency. The relationship of structural domains of the CFI and OCF is a matter of practical relevance, and it's important for several reasons. Recall Engel's aspirational goals for the BPS model. Such models are intended to provide a blueprint for research, a framework for teaching, and a design for action in the real world of healthcare. Let's look now at each of the questions of the CFI and see how they relate to the four substantive domains of the OCF. The colors help to visualize that relationship. Note that some questions, number, uh, numbers six, seven, nine, and 13, address the interests of more than one OCF domain. Note also that most of the questions are green, indicating that they address concepts of distress. In this slide, we see the domain structure of the OCF color-coded as a reference on the left. 
the domain structure of the CFI and sections under uh, its domains are indicated on the right. The color codes show how questions under the CFI domains presented in the previous slide address topical interests of the OCF domains. Note that the illness-related concepts of distress, that is illness experience, perceived causes, and help seeking in the CFI, that is domain two of the OCF. They are addressed exclusively in domain one of the CFI, but they are also considered in all domains of the CFI. An overarching structure emerges. It distinguishes domain-related interests focusing either on the illness, that is the concepts of illness, the person, cultural identity, or on aspects of social context affecting the illness. The preponderant emphasis of the CFI on illness is not necessarily a problem if other interests are well considered by some questions of the CFI or from other sources in a clinical evaluation that are acknowledged and therefore encouraged by the OCF. Initially before the, OC, before the CFI, the OCF was there to provide a guide to assessment. That remains true. And so, um, it's not necessary that equal numbers of questions of the CFI are allotted to each domain of the OCF, but it is important that there is some means of making that assessment. You should keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, that the value of the CFI is derived not only from the information obtained in the interview, but also from the interview process. Regarding interests of social medicine, it's clear that both the questions of the CFI and domains of the OCF are inadequately intent, uh, they're inadequately attentive to the impact of structural features of society, which are the priorities of social medicine and structural competency training. Like Engels BPS in that regard, in considering social context, the OCF emphasizes interpersonal rather than societal structural issues. This suggests a need for rethinking and revising the OCF as a sociocultural formulation, which more carefully and clearly elaborates and distinguishes uh, structural issues that are missing in the current framework. The analysis suggests that it may also be worthwhile to consider revision of the CFI, perhaps as a sociocultural formulation interview. But that may be less clear because if its priority is indicated, the priority of structural issues, if it's indicated in a revised OCF, that is revised as a sociocultural formulation, then relevant structural information may be obtained in other ways apart from an intake interview. This slide represents a revised framework for OCF that constitutes a sociocultural formulation more attentive to social issues. Questions about, um, and here you see domain one and two are similar to the DSM-5, uh, considering cultural identity and the broad formulation of cultural concepts of distress designated in the slide as illness explanatory models. Domain three and four focus on, uh, domains three and four focus on social context. They distinguish social interpersonal and societal structural issues. That is a substantial change from the OCF, which distinguished undifferentiated social issues, mainly focusing in the description of the domain as interpersonal in domain three and the particular relationship of patient and clinician in domain four. Domain five of the DSM-5 OCF was not really a distinct topical interest. It was actually a summary and synthesis of findings from the other four topical domains and their implications. That interest in synthesis is now explicit in the SCF. 
In this slide, we see a mapping of the CFI questions to the revised domain structure of the SCF. Mapping to domains one and two are the same. For domain four, concerning structural issues, we notice that uh, two relevant questions, number seven and number 13, deal only in part and with limited aspects of broad interest in structural issues. Here we examine, uh, uh, or here we, we try to approximate quantitatively the relative focus of each question on, uh, on each domain. We also see coverage of each domain uh, by the questions. We see the coverage in summing up how all of the questions have addressed that domain. And for each of the questions, as before, um, we have that association with the, uh, with the domain. And here we've quantified it for those that have overlapping interests. The fact that some CFI questions address a single SCF domain and others address two or three is not necessarily a problem. That is so because the relevant considerations for acquiring clinical information are not necessarily the same as the way that information is organized or used. On the other hand, the fact that attention to structural issues is so limited, only 4% by this crude estimation, that is indeed a problem. And that issue requires attention to harmonize priorities of cultural and structural assessment. Corrective attention may involve revision of the CFI assessment and or acknowledgement of the need to get the relevant information about structural issues in other ways. I conclude by highlighting four points. They are grounded in my review presented at the beginning of the presentation on historical frameworks in which clinical case formulation is embedded. And they are based on recent experience in field trials with the CFI examined critically with reference to cultural and structural priorities. One, the CFI prioritizes assessment of cultural concepts of illness, explanatory models that is, but gives less attention to other topical domains of the DSM-5 OCF. The OCF does not distinguish social interpersonal and societal structural issues well enough to encourage assessment and address priorities of social medicine. A revised framework as sociocultural formulation is suggested to harmonize assessment priorities of cultural psychiatry and social medicine and for use in clinical practice, research, and training. The recommended SCF will benefit from further experience and use. Testing is currently underway by the research team in Pune, where the SCF was developed. Thank you for your attention. So at this point, um, that's basically what I wanted to present. And um, hopefully now we could open it up for some questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Mitchell, for that really lucid and, uh, you know, uh, important presentation. Of Thank you so much for your, the elegant way you've laid out these issues and, and for really the impetus to try to improve the tools that we have. We did get this toehold in, in the DSM for what it's worth, uh, but we're speaking to a much larger view of, of, you know, not just of diseases, but of predicaments and of, of really trying to do right by the people who come to us for help and, and make sure the right tools are there educationally and so on. And I think this is a very important step uh, forward to for future conversations. Thank you all. Thank you.